so it's not a bad idea to ask um, why why would you bother doing a meta analysis? Because hopefully by the end of the day you'll realise that uh, it should be a lot of work. Um, it could, I mean, if your if your literature is very small, it, it could be done quite quickly. But if your literature is anything like any of the ones that I do, um, it's going to be a lot of work. So why why bother at all? I thought that would be a good place to start. If you do an individual study, maybe for your PhD, probably you'll do a few studies for your PhD, but um, say an undergraduate project or uh, you get a little bit of money to run a pilot study. Uh, sorry to bring <laughs> be the bearer of bad news, but you're not going to answer a question in science with a single study. It might take decades, it might take many, many individual studies, there might be wrong turns, you might go backwards, science might just go completely down the wrong route. So for me, one, one important reason for doing meta-analysis is that you can actually try and answer questions that aren't limited by and biased by your own data or your own outlook or your own particular set of methods. The point of meta-analysis meta then is to offer a range of statistical but also just graphical ways to look at data from different laboratories, different times, different literatures, um, different experiments. Um, I'm going to assume everyone is kind of doing experiments in their work or or at least using numerical data to um, to analyze biological or human or neuroscience kind of variables. So any any kind of human study, it's pretty much essential, I would say, as part of the toolbox for human studies and animals and any kind of biology because we're just very variable beings. So the day then is, uh, as I've outlined, we're in the introduction and the whole the whole thing is really an introduction. Um, there are many ways of doing meta-analysis, many different paths you can take. Um, and so I'm kind of just going to bring you up to speed with what I think is important for the kind of stuff that I've done. So it's an introduction, a day long introduction. And then I think uh, a prerequisite really for a meta-analysis is to know that you're, you've got access to most of the studies that are relevant. There's kind of no point in analyzing a biased set of studies. So you need some method for choosing the studies you're going to use. And that's what part two is about. So how do you generally choose those studies? Um, part three is the most most boring and most intense part of the, of the day. And that's on um, effect sizes. So uh, how do you actually calculate the numbers that you need for a meta-analysis? And that's, there's a lot of equations in there. So part three is really like a reference, uh, sort of a, a lookup or a glossary for all the equations and other things you might need as you're doing the rest of it. Part four is very practical, like given you've got a, a PDF in front of you or a, a, a web page with a scientific study on it, how do you actually get the data you need from that paper and what data to look for and what, how to correct the errors, shall we say, in, in published papers. Once you've got all your data out, you should then start plotting it. Um, you should look at it. There's no point doing any sort of statistical analysis if you haven't looked at your data. And in meta-analysis, there are a couple of a couple of very common ways of plotting data that makes makes it useful, makes it um, more apparent what's going on in your data. And these are called forest plots and funnel plots, and they've they've got nice names. So we'll just learn about a bit, bit about those and how to make them. And then what you can get from these two plots, what kind of conclusions you can draw and what statistics you might get from those data and then part six <laughs> for about 10 minutes it, it, that's where we do the meta-analysis and then part seven on what once you've done a meta-analysis what you should do next what, what's it for this principle i think uh holds for all research and all all computing um and we're in this sort of so-called age of artificial intelligence where where the computers are suddenly cleverer than we are it's it's junk. It's not true. Your analysis, your paper, your artificial intelligence is only as good as the data that you put into it and the, the assumptions that you program into your analysis or your artificial intelligence. So, it, you know, it doesn't take long for a uh, an artificial, an AI to produce impossible images or to become a racist chatbot. You know, all these things are heavily biased by what goes in. And that is especially true in meta-analysis, as I hope you'll see through some of the examples that I'll give you through the day. If you put junk, garbage, rubbish, <laughs> biased data into your meta-analysis, 
that's all you'll get out as well. Um, and so really the main job, probably I'd say 90% of the job of meta-analysis is trying to work out what's what's junk, <laughs> what, what's not true, what needs correcting, what needs to be uh, unbiased or adjusted, what to include in the first place. The whole the whole process really for me is about trying to work out what what is the real data that we should actually be analysing here. Um, so I th I think my sort of rules of thumb, and I've just made these up. I haven't sort of for this for creating this this talk today. I haven't really consulted any textbooks on meta analysis, and I'll put a caveat at the end of this introduction to tell you. Um, so what's important to me is that. If you're going to avoid producing a garbage meta-analysis then you need to be systematic in how you go about it you need to look for and correct errors and there will be lots of errors in in other in published work and you need to be aware of those and correct them where, where you can you need to extract the relevant variables and make make a code for them so that you can try and systematically encode all the data that you're extracting uh, this is a quantitative approach so we're not doing any qualitative analyses it's going to be entirely numerical so if you can't put a number to it, then it's probably not something you can you can include in your meta analysis, or at least a code. Maybe not a number. You can have categorical codes for things, but if you can't sort of order things and count them, um, then it's pretty difficult to include in the meta analysis. And then hopefully, if you do all of this, you can then try and come to an unbiased conclusion, and that's kind of the ideal. Probably rarely happens in truth. There is sort of a blind trust in uh, in meta analysis, and I've only realised this in the last couple of years. There are all these schemes, these pyramid schemes, where like you can rate the quality of, of evidence, particularly in medicine clinical studies. So this, this is an example from the BMJ, British Medical Journal, and there are loads of similar triangles like this, and and they they always have systematic review and meta analysis at the top. The idea of that is that it's somehow better than all the individual studies that. By combining all the data from all the studies, you can end up with a, a better, more valid, in this case, conclusion. But that's only true if, if this part is any good. <laughs> and, uh, and it's sometimes not, sometimes it's terrible. Uh, and so you, sh you should not just have a blind trust of meta-analysis or systematic review, um, although people do. Uh, I, I did until about a couple of years ago when I realized, oh, you can have a bad meta-analysis. I just assume that people doing meta-analysis were good at statistics, but it's not true. Uh, so here's an example. The first interactive start of the day. Um, can you tell me what is wrong with this meta-analysis? So this is the kind of meta-analysis you might see. It's pretty much all there. You've got three studies. You've got some means and some standard deviations. I think that's the sample size there. And then two groups, experimental and control. Uh, they've weighted the three means depending on the size of the group and they've calculated the um, the meta-analytic effect over here and then they've got this is a forest plot if you've not seen these before this is a forest plot and they've got lots of stats there so what can anyone spot there's a glaring problem <laughs> if you don't know now that's good because it means we're there's something to learn today and then at the end i think in session six or seven i'll give you the answer to this conundrum the reason I put this in the talk is because when I read this paper, this is when I realized that meta analyses could just be wrong, uh, really, really badly wrong as well. Um, just by looking at those numbers, um, and if you know what you're looking for, you should see immediately that this is there's something wrong here. So yeah, the first, the main, the main point of the day is to ensure that you have enough basic understanding of, of statistics to um, to not produce garbage <laughs> when you when you publish a meta analysis. I just I searched meta analysis garbage in garbage out and I found a paper. There's a link at the bottom, Vyman et al. Uh, Vyman 2009, meta analyses in psychopharma psychopharmacotherapy garbage in garbage out question mark. So it's a well known phenomenon this garbage in garbage out thing. Yeah, just to say what the focus of the session. It's only going to be on the very simplest kind, probably the first kind you might become acquainted with in a meta analysis. So we're just focusing on par simple parametric data where it's, it's continuous numbers like you know, temperature or time or weight, you know, nice simple numbers, mostly within participants or within subjects or um, a repeated measures design and only really simple differences between two conditions or groups. This is really just the very basic like starter meta-analysis if you like. 
So we're not looking at odds ratios. These come up a lot in, in diseases. So what's the relative risk of, say, dying from cancer if you smoke or if you don't smoke? Those, those, those data are very commonly reported in the press and the, and the news, and, and they're often in odds ratios. We're not going to look directly at correlations, but I'll show you how you can convert correlations to do this. Um, no non-parametric data, so no categorical or ordinal data. There should be specific methods for those. But my feeling is once you know enough about statistics to get to the, the end of the day without producing garbage, then I think you'll know enough to then do very different analyses with different kinds of data. So that's my hope, at least. Here comes the caveat. I've done a bit of meta-analysis, but I'm not an expert at all. So if you find yourself disagreeing or you find yourself, uh, you have, if you have questions and if I can't answer them specifically, uh, that's not the end of the story. There, there will be loads and loads of meta-analysis experts out there. But I, so I just wanted to kind of say, although I'm not an expert, I just kind of want to give you my credentials. Also, if I put all these links on my website, then my, um, my Google page rank uh, will go up according to Google algorithms. So my you know, lots and lots of links to my own material, that's good for me. So I've been studying stats for 20, 30 years, um, did it at A level. Um, I've written six papers on stats, two systematic reviews, four other systematic reviews and meta-analysis, one meta-analysis on its own. And I'm currently doing what is the rid ridiculously large um, meta-analysis, which has turned into 300 studies. Um, it's very painful. Um, and I have an episode on my podcast. Uh, the last most recent one about episode 36 is about it was when I realized that there were going to be 300 studies in this in this latest meta-analysis, I sort of took a break and asked myself, is it worth doing at all? Um, it is worth doing. The answer is, is down there. It's not, it's not a bad question to ask. If you've only got a limited time, if it's in your PhD particularly, if you set out on a meta-analysis and you suddenly realize there's going to be 300 studies, you need to put aside a year to do that. You know, if you're going to read them all, if you're going to read them all properly, if you're going to extract the data, and you know there are 300 experimental studies that you need to work on, I'd say it's going to take you a year. So it, you do need to ask this question. When you realize how much data is out there, what you can really achieve in the time available. I've seen one paper where they meta-analyzed 620 studies, neuroscience studies as well, and it was, it was insane. It was about 70 pages long in a printed journal. I mean, it's, it would have been thousands and thousands of hours and days so yeah, um, is it worth it? Do do ask that do ask that question.